one as it relates to multi-employer collective agreements. I call the Honourable Liz, Ian Lees Galloway. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I thank members uh, for their contributions on part one so far. Um, members have largely addressed two issues, that of union access and of multi-employer collective agreements, and I'd like to speak to uh, some of the points raised by, uh, by members on each of those issues. I'll address first uh, union access, and I'd point members to uh, part 4, section 22, clause 3 uh, of the Employment Relations Act. Uh, which states that a representative of a union exercising the right to enter a workplace must, at the time of the initial entry and if requested by the employer or a representative of the employer or by a person in control of the workplace at any time entering the workplace, give the purpose of the entry and produce evidence of his identity uh, and evidence of or his or her identity and evidence of his or her, her authority to represent the union concerned. Uh, and also um, clause two of the same uh, part and section says that a uh, representative of a union exercising the right to enter a workplace may only do so at reasonable times during any period when the employee is employed to work in the workplace and must do so in a reasonable way, having regard to normal business operations in the workplace, and must comply with any existing reasonable procedures and requirements applying in respect of the workplace that relate to safety and health uh, or security. Now, those clauses are unchanged uh, by this bill. And I hope give members some satisfaction that there is no so-called unfettered union access uh, to the workplace. Of course, union officials must present themselves to the employer. Of course, they must give regard to proper health and safety practices. If an induction is required to a workplace, uh, then of course the union organiser must ensure that they are properly inducted and they understand the health and safety uh, procedures of that workplace. Um, but of course, also, it is important that union members are able to uh, um, give effect to their right to freedom of association and their right uh, to get support from a union official if they are in need of that support. And if union members call their union and ask their official to come on to the workplace to deal uh, with an employment matter or a health and safety matter, then they should be able to get timely access uh, to that union official. And I think. The combination of the provisions that are currently laid out in the Employment Relations Act uh, and that are included uh, in this bill and the supplementary order to this bill in my name strike that right balance between giving uh, union members uh, access to their union officials uh, and ensuring that employers have the right and proper ability uh, to control activity that goes on in their workplace. Uh, I want to turn now to the question of multi-employer collective agreements. A number of members uh, have referenced this matter. Uh, Paul Goldsmith uh, raised the question of um, multi-employer collective agreements sort of being a one-size-fits-all that uh, are not capable of taking into account regional variations in, in, uh, in labour markets. That is not the case. Uh, it is perfectly acceptable for a multi-employer collective agreement to include variations of, of pay rates or other variations that are agreed between the employer and the or employers in the case of a multi-employment collective agreement and, and the union uh, representing workers uh, who work for those employers. Um, I'm aware uh, that negotiations uh, in the past for the Nurses uh, District Health Board multi-employer collective agreement uh, did consider the possibility of regional variation such as an Auckland wage. Now that was determined not to be something that the parties wanted to explore, but it is something that they were entitled to explore, and there's nothing uh, in the provisions of this Act or, or this amendment bill uh, that um, preclude that from happening. Uh, Mr uh, Bidwar uh, made, I thought, a very thoughtful uh, contribution also on Mecca's and, and referred to his own experience from the supermarket world. And he asked, how, you know, how do these, these multi-employer collective agreements work on a practical basis? And I would reference uh, the, uh, the nurses collective agreement and the DHBs. Nurses, the nurses organisation has a number of multi-employer collective agreements across the different parts of the health system. Uh, 20 employers uh, employing people to do essentially the same job. Both the employers and the employees see it as a much more efficient way to deal with the terms and conditions of, of their work 
to do it through a multi-employer collective uh, agreement uh, that applies to employees doing the same work that is, uh, that is covered by that, uh, by that mecca um, across all of those 20 different employers. So that's the practicalities, Madam Chair. The Honourable um, Ian Lee's going That's away. the practicalities of how a multi-employer collective agreement works. Let me bring it back to, um, to the, the supermarket situation. Now, Countdown has a collective agreement. I'll grant the House that it's not a multi-employer collective agreement because of the structure of their business. Uh, they are one employer that uh, employs people all around the country. But the first union has a collective agreement that covers workers in all 187 countdown shops across the whole country. It works well. Uh, countdown are very pleased with it. They are very proud of their relationship with First Union, and it allows them to develop an enduring and ongoing relationship between the employer and their workforce to deal with matters that are not, not just the matters that are considered as part of collective bargaining, but to, to, but to address the broader employment relationship. And I, I know yeah, there's, there's been tension. Uh, I, have, I have stood uh, on the line uh, during a lockout uh, that, were, that uh, um, occurred many, many years ago where Progressive Enterprises, the owners of Countdown, uh, locked out their workers as part of a, a, an employment dispute. But the enduring relationship goes on and both sides are very proud of it. So it can work tremendously well and it can work across the country. It, I do not accept. Uh, that either multi-employer collective agreements or, or single-employer collective agreements are a one-size-fits-all approach, and that they are not applicable across different parts of the New Zealand of New Zealand, because the evidence tells us that they can and do work well. I want to uh, just address some of the matters raised by Nick Smith as well. Uh, he said that port companies will be dragged back to having meccas. Port companies have never had a multi-employer collective agreement. There has never been a multi-employer collective agreement in the port sector. And, and I've heard a lot from the port companies about their concerns. I say to them, this bill is restoring what was in place when Labor was last in government. There is no reason to imagine that the situation would be any different. In fact, by, uh, through the supplementary order paper, we are ensuring that that, um, that, that, that point of case law, that the duty to conclude collective bargaining does not apply to multi-employer collective agreements, is now enshrined in the legislation. That makes it much clearer. I think the port companies have absolutely nothing to fear from this, and in fact, I encourage them to build a much stronger relationship with their with their uh, union uh, their unionised members. Nick Smith also used the term "screw the scrum." Why are we screwing the scrum? Well, I, I attempted to address that in my opening remarks. That included in the object of the Employment Relations Act is the statement that there is an inherent imbalance between the employer and the employee. The legislation is designed to address that balance, and that's what multi-employer collective agreements are about, giving more strength to working people, giving them the option of bargaining collectively, not just within their own employer, but across their industry for better terms and conditions that apply to unionised members across their industry, because we recognise in this legislation, and the National Party never got rid of this clause of the, of the legislation. So when they were in government, they agreed that there is an inherent imbalance between the employer and the employee. We are giving effect to that object of the Act to overcome that inherent imbalance, and multi-employer collective agreements are part of that, Madam Chair. I call Dr Palmjeet Palmer. Thank you, Madam Chair, for this opportunity. Madam Chair, it was really interesting to hear this from the Minister.